Recap in minutes. In today's video, we will be enjoying a war, action film, based on true events entitled Panfilos 28. There will be spoilers ahead, chill out and enjoy. The movie begins in the winter of 1941 in Soviet Russia. A Soviet lieutenant named, Vasily asks everyone in attendance if someone has any experience with tractors. An NCO named, Muskolenko Volin told his friend, but the young soldier admits that he's a machinist, not a tractor operator. Lieutenant Vasily continues with his discussion regarding enemy tanks and how they operate. In a room nearby, officers nervously await and listen to their company commander's phone conversation. After the phone call, the commander gets on a white horse as he is called to headquarters. It doesn't take long before he leaves his officers, Peter, and the others, to do their job. Back at the other side of camp, Lieutenant Vasily finishes discussing the theory on how to destroy enemy tanks, and now, they'll have to practice it. He then orders Muskolenko to get some materials from the engineers to construct a makeshift tank. While the men get to work, their assigned political officer reads a story of a comrade who was deemed a Red Army hero after dying while destroying an enemy anti-tank gun and bringing along a few Nazi troopers with him to the grave. A few feet away, a young soldier named, Gabriel is cutting wood with a much older comrade and discussing a possible offensive soon. Later in the evening, they finish constructing the wooden tank, and the lieutenant drills his men on ways to destroy a tank from a dugout. Musebek, a young Russian soldier, misses the throw, and so Vasily instructs him that they can still attack the tank from behind. But it's getting dark, and some men are tired, so Vasily orders them to take a break. Meanwhile, the officers are deliberating the Germans' current whereabouts and possible routes of attack as they pass different cities. The commander then informs them that their mission is to stop a whole Nazi division from where they stand until reinforcements arrive. They know it's no easy task to face a much more superior army in terms of equipment. Despite the clear disadvantage given their circumstance, not one officer voiced a complaint. The commander looks at his men goofing around through the window. But he let them be since that might be their last time to do so. Later, the soldiers were given orders to move out. The men go into their respective barracks, pack up, and rendezvous outside the sleepy village. A young Soviet soldier meets up with his girl for the last time and catches up with his comrades in arms. Deep into the night, the company commander briefs his men that the fascist Nazis are planning to invade their beloved motherland and are headed to Russia's capital, Moscow. He encourages his men with his charismatic speech that they'll be holding their position. Not soon after, in the cover of darkness, the men march towards their assigned place in between the 316th Infantry and 50th Cavalry. Two junior officers named, Captain Pavel and Klochkov asked the commander why they'll not take the fight to the Germans instead. The commander simply replied that they do not have the means to attack but have a fighting chance if they defend. Soon they arrive at their positions, and the men start digging some foxholes, taking full advantage of the darkness. They continue to dig and make trenches for their anti-tank guns and artillery. Some of the men build rapport by joking around and exchanging stories while digging to pass by time. Moments later, a German scout plane passes by. A Soviet named Chardon points his rifle at the plane in hopes of shooting it down. His comrades warn him not to shoot because it most likely wouldn't hit, but after firing a round, the other soldier joins Chardon. Meanwhile, two Soviet soldiers deliver a heavy roll of barbed wire. The talkative among the two shares to the men working and making the barbed wire post that he once asked a few townsfolk nearby Moscow to trade the barbed wire for food. In the end, after knocking on a few houses, none had a need for a barbed wire, and they didn't get any food for it. Soon it's night again, Captain Pavel gets a phone call from their commander, asking for any updates. The captain reports their progress and informs the commander that they're currently taking a rest. On the same front, the Soviet's counterparts, the Nazis, were making their bid as well. They are preparing for the offensive. Early the next day, the Germans started bombarding the Russians' decoy position. The bombardment signals the start of the bloody offensive. After the barrage of bombs, the Germans advance. A dozen tanks escorted by a company of infantry make their way towards the trenches, and the Soviets hold their fire. After a few minutes of intense wait, the Soviets fire their own artillery catching the Germans off guard. The Nazi advance party suffers a number of causalities, both tanks, and infantry. With the element of surprise as part of their weapon, the first wave of Nazis is forced to retreat. Now that the surprise has been presented, the Soviet soldiers know that the Krauts will come back even smarter and stronger. The gunners at the flank relocate while others in the trenches prepare for the next attack wave. Captain Pavel phones the commander and reports the situation. The Soviet captain then orders to dig in since the Germans will adjust their artillery fire and rain down on them. 
At the trenches, a man named, Nazarov, hesitates to take cover. He wants to shoot down a plane with his machine gun but fails to do so, as one passes by overhead. After being screamed at by a sergeant, Natarev takes cover. As expected, the German artillery heavily bombards the Russians' location. Meanwhile, the Soviets on the ground try their very best to hold on. The commander anxiously awaits news from the front at HQ while thunder-like noises from the bombing echo throughout the area. An operator under his command tries to reach the companies at the front but to no avail. A hundred dropped bombs later, the Soviet troops slowly got back to a defensive position to anticipate the Nazis in their second wave of attack. The German shells didn't go to waste as there were dozens of casualties on the Russian side. Afterward, the German tank engines start roaring to life and moving forward. Back at the Soviet position, with no ways of communication, the captain orders a soldier named Pete, to trace and fix the telephone wires. Minutes later, the connections are set, and the captain immediately reports the situation to the colonel that many died and a good number are wounded. All in all, there are about 28 soldiers left to defend the position. The colonel stands by his order that the troops will defend and hold their position until reinforcements arrive. Meanwhile, the Nazi invaders' second wave is just over the horizon. The Russians in the trenches prepare their bombs in case the tanks come close. Then the captain arrives and orders the men to group themselves and target a tank. He then discloses that they are to defend the line until their dying breath because if the Germans penetrate their position, there's no stopping them from getting to Moscow. The Soviets tried the same strategy and attacks from the flank with a few men left. A fierce firefight ensues, but the Germans quickly incapacitate the cannon and the men operating it. At the front trenches, Musebek fires his anti-tank rifle, but a few minutes later, a German tank gets in range and kills Musebek and another with its machine gunfire. The nearest soldier picks up the large rifle and relocates. After running a few meters, the young Soviet aims at the incoming panzer and hits its tracks, making it unable to advance. Gabriel and his partner rip through the infantry with their machine gun on the opposite side. Meanwhile, as the tanks got closer to the trenches, the Soviets below threw their improvised grenades and Molotov cocktails. Gabriel and his partner continue to fire at the flank, only stopping to reload. The tanks take notice of them and aim their turret towards their position. The two soldiers continued to massacre the enemy soldiers but were later hit by the tank, killing them instantly. The Germans were rather persistent, but so were the defenders. When a tank got close, a Russian soldier primes his Molotov bomb. He then tries to throw it but gets hit in the body multiple times. But it didn't stop him from throwing the fiery grenade before taking his last breath. Subsequently, another group of Russians took a different kind of approach to destroying another panzer. Two soldiers initiate a covering fire, while a soldier named Ivan throws grenades at the tank to destroy it. The attempt is successful, but it cost a Russian life. Now, the defense didn't have anything left to counter the tanks, and so they decided to let the tanks pass but continue to pick the German infantries. As time passes, the 28 men left are slowly dying one by one. The soldier that manned the cannon in the flank dies after an incoming tank fire its cannon in their direction. The same thing happened with the soldier defending the line with an anti-tank rifle. Still, the Soviets weren't going down without a fight. After a German tank is disabled, a Soviet soldier runs towards it and throws a Molotov inside the tank, burning the tank crew alive. After hours of fighting, the Russians run out of ammo. In a desperate attempt to fool the Germans, a Russian soldier throws a rock in the enemy's direction. The Germans fell for it but eventually continued to move forward after seeing that it was a rock. The Nazis soon passed the barbed wires and were just a meters away from the trenches. The remaining Russians prepare their bayonet, axes, knives, shovels, and whatever melee weapons they can find. The Germans know they outnumbered the Soviets by a margin, they continue to march on fully alert and prepared. Just when the Germans are within a few feet away from the trenches, a volley of machine gun fire kills the enemy infantry, just in time to save the remaining men in the trenches. From a distance, the second wave of a tank lines up and observes the situation on the battlefield. Turns out, the man handling the machine gun was the Soviet named Danil, who was shot by a cannon earlier. He was shooting anything that moved. The enemy soldiers drop to the ground in hopes of saving themselves from the onslaught. The Nazis are pinned to the ground and can't advance, and so, with not much choice, they surviving attackers retreat. The German tank officer observing a few kilometers away assesses the situation and sees none of the second waves of troops are left. Not a single German fascist soul in sight. A graveyard and killing field for both men and tanks. Without knowing the defending Russians were on their last legs, the German officer makes the crucial mistake of ordering a retreat. Meanwhile, the remaining Soviet men are relieved to hear the tanks moving away. 
They take a deep breath after they are able to put their minds at ease after an intense skirmish that almost wiped out the armies on both sides. The movie ends as the sun sets in a beautiful yet tragic scene. Beauty and madness. A once peaceful countryside turned into a graveyard for both man and machine. The remaining survivors gather as they watch and reflect on the aftermath of the carnage. They were an entire company in the morning, consisting of hundreds of men, by the end of the day, they were barely a platoon. But a platoon of heroes nonetheless. Prominent statues are erected in the area to commemorate the battle that saved Russia. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more videos like this and to help the channel grow.